Hello everybody, we are on episode, brilliant, I can't even remember which episode we're on now, five? Somewhere around there. <laughs> um, and this one is all about how people who do think differently end up being society's, if you want to get back to the word, backbone. Um... Or well, excuse the pun, rock stars. And uh, on the left, we have Mac, who will be probably stealing the microphone for me from for most of the entire show today. <laughs> and our guest on the right. I've been watching too much news channels, so hence why the positions. <laughs> Over to awesome. Mac. Awesome stuff. Well, Shana, it is an. Am I pronouncing your name right? By the way. You are amazing, amazing. Um, it's it's an absolute pleasure to have you on uh, yet another episode of Fighting for the Right to Party, and uh, you know, uh, understanding how neurodiverse uh, individuals become you know society's rock stars. Um, and I've got loads of questions, um, you know, about how you, uh, you know, how neurodiversity came into your world. Um, why it's a, a subject you want to speak on. Um, I noticed that on LinkedIn, as an example, you don't have a lot on your profile about that. Um, so I think uh, people are going to learn a lot more about you um, on LinkedIn today, uh, as well as YouTube and, and everywhere else that um, uh, uh, Joel is streaming. Um, I think Facebook as well. So um, you can see it better than I can, Mike. You've got six screens, and I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, I think um, uh, the the reality is, you know, you, we're going to get your your name out there even a little bit more on LinkedIn. Um, what are the main platforms that you normally hang out on, Shana? Uh, for the last five months, it's been LinkedIn. Uh, prior to that, I was mainly just on um, Facebook and Instagram. Okay, so uh, let the people of LinkedIn know a little bit more about you. Um, yeah, I'd love you to do just kind of a, a one or two minute kind of intro into who you are, what you do, because you, you're involved in some fascinating things. Um, and uh, yeah, I've actually just posted on LinkedIn uh, on my profile a little bit more about the company that you work with as an example. Um, but, uh, yeah, we want to, you know, kind of know who is Shana, what are the things that you're involved in, what are your passions and why neurodiversity, um, you know, features in your world. Oh man, that's a lot to unpack there, Mac. So, uh, I <laughs> am question. still, I'm still trying to figure out who Shana is. Um, and I will, I will tell you why, because I think who I thought I was, uh, for the last few decades, uh, was based on everyone else's conditioning. Uh, whether it be, you know, society, generational and whatnot. Um, so I am still unpacking a lot of uh, who I became just to please other people and really continuing to try to heal to continue to grow and continue to learn things about myself to to be the true Shana, right? So I've uh, I've made pretty good progress, but that is why I am so passionate about my work, to be honest with you. Um, I started off studying psychology and uh, I, I was a criminal justice minor, but it wasn't it wasn't an alignment. So uh, let, let's put it this way. I don't I don't like law books very much. And we studied a lot of that. So I switched over to like neuroscience and a whole bunch of the, the boring science stuff, as my parents used to say. But I was I was a nerd. Um, it was uh, it was kind of crazy because I. I knew I thought differently than everyone else. I, I didn't know that it, I had something like ADHD. Um, we, we didn't talk about these things. My parents are actually immigrants from Portugal. So there, there's one way to be, and, and that's it. You know, um, you had to fit that box and, and that was the extent of your life. Uh, but I did know I was different. So learning all of these different, you know, psychological things and, um, learning about neurodiversity over the, over many years now, a few decades, uh, I was like, wow, I'm reading about these things. And I'm like, holy crap, check, 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 check. Like, th this is me. And I started doing some studying on things like ADHD and um, 
you know, like different, different neurological conditions and things like dyslexia. And, you know, I had some kids and I, I knew that my, she's my middle child, but she thinks differently. Right. Um, so I had to start learning a lot more about what was going on. Um, and the cool thing was she could do these amazing things that no one else could do. And I, I can do some amazing things that I, I found not to be uh, typical, right, with, with typical human beings. So we can like hyper focus on stuff. Um, so I started hyper focusing actually on uh, family and marriage coaching. So instead of finishing uh, psychology school, I decided to leave. I had I had my kids um, and I, I went to coaching school. I also uh, did physical therapy for a while. So I kind of started learning correlations between the mental processes and, and different psychologies uh, and different conditions and how that energy was stored in the body based on how we process things. So that's a really long way to say I basically help people be rock stars now. So I like to inform parents uh, to be able to parent in a way that is not going to create some of these medical conditions. I, I truly believe that they are created based on our environment and not something that we are necessarily born with. Um, that's been my personal belief with some research that I've been doing for the last few years. So I try to teach parents and educators now how to create an environment for neurotypical children as well as neurodivergent children and how to make sure that they all succeed and can be authentically empowered, um, regardless of how they think. Wow. Well, before I jump in, um, Joel, uh, anything from you before I get stuck in? Because I have questions. <laughs> and I have, and I am for the first time in 30 years lost for words. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> That's all good. Um, so I'll, I'll jump straight in because this is, a, it's an interesting one because you know, what you're talking about is having education around the environment and built around the child rather than getting the child to fit into the education system. Now, this is something that Joel and I have spoken about so many times about how globally our systems are broken in the sense that, um, you know, our education system is built on a historic uh, framework which ultimately doesn't serve where we are today. And, you know, if we look at just the last 10, 15 years on how technology has advanced and how quickly our children pick up on technology and be able to use things um, in, a, in a totally different way to communicate than what we did, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, that feels like a long time ago, but in, you know, the greater uh, scheme of things, it's not really, but our education system hasn't really caught up in the sense that it's child focused. Um, it's very much numbers focused. It's how much can we teach in a, as, as large a group and 30 tends to be that kind of number that, you know, around the world, if you look at classrooms, um, or, you know, some schools are much larger than that, but 30 tends to be the kind of typical kind of number. Um, and, and that doesn't lean towards individuality. It doesn't lean towards, um, you know, focusing on specific skill sets that children are more prone to um, adapt to that, that, that kind of uh, resonate with themselves. Um, and I think, you know, we're in a beautiful place in the world because of the fact that we have much more openness now than we did 15, 20 years ago. Um, and it's quite frightening when you think about how, um, you know, somebody that's different because you didn't comply made your life so much harder as an individual. Uh, whereas now look at our creatives around the world. There's so many rock stars out there in the sense of, you know, not necessarily music, but in all facets of life where individuals are autistic, neurodiverse, uh, dyslexic. Uh, I'm unfortunately only two out of those three. Um, <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's those individuals that think differently, which allows us to be able to yeah. kind of plot the course for our world in a different way. Um, so with that kind of 
staging, uh, as it were. Um, you know, what are the kind of give us the kind of top two three things that you think are really need needed right now within our education system for there to be a shift. You you want just two or three things, Matt? The, 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 the problem oh, is, Lord. I know you could probably come up with hundreds, but what would you yeah. say are kind of the two or three you know kind of key priorities to really start driving this change? Because our education system is so slow at adapting and and moving forward because of historic, archaic red tape and uh, things like that. I'll be honest with you. That's what I'm targeting right now is education. And, and the reason for that is because you can teach the the same, you know, curriculum that that needs to be taught in less than half the time that our kids are sitting in school. The problem with our education system today is we are doing that in a way that is not conducive to the brain actually retaining the information. So, for example, you have uh, children in their first seven years of life where they need to learn through play. They, they have to. It's If you're going to sit a, a child in a classroom and you're going to force them to focus on something and not do it through play, where the information is easily retained, they're in a very relaxed environment, um, that they'll just pick it up very quickly. So when we start this from daycares and preschools and we're continuing this right through, what we're actually doing is forcing them to be in high stress environments and think about just as adults when your brain is already developed you're already fully developed at this point it is very difficult for me to learn anything if i am in a high stress environment internally um and it, it's not a war zone you know people think of high stress environments like well the kid's not growing up in like a war zone but it's the internal stress it's what happens within the body of the child is what is stopping the information from being retained and then being able to be you recalled later, right? Um, so I truly believe that being able to teach kids in a way that is developmentally appropriate for that particular age and changing that based on the next state of development. So like next would be the ages like seven through 10 and then 10 through 13. And if you sectioned it that way and created an education system that is really ta tailored to a generalized developmental stage you would be able to get these kids to learn this curriculum in an hour and a half to two hours in the day. I truly believe the remainder of the school day, if you are still going to continue it for being as long as it is, especially here in the United States, where these kids are in school for anywhere from six to eight and a half hours, depending on where you are, you know, uh, location wise. Um, but that being said, you could spend the rest of that time on teaching them things like authentic empowerment, teaching them how to conflict, uh, you know, things like conflict resolution. You can teach them emotional intelligence. You can teach them all of these skill sets, right? You can do way more music classes, way more painting, way more artistic things where that energy or anything that they're storing from their home environment can now be released in some way that is healthy, right? So you're, you're continuing to make these environments where these kids can learn the information very quickly that they need to know, and then also having the skill sets to be able to continue to move forward through their developmental stages in a very healthy and normal way. Um, and as far as neurodivergent, you know, children, we need those environments to be as low stress as possible because it's even more important for the neurodivergent child to be seen, to be heard, to be able to express in a way that makes sense for them. And especially with things like autism, um, and I've had quite a bit of experience with nonverbal autistic, they learn through things like music. They learn through, you know, different types of, of arts, if you will. And this is what we're trying to remove from schools. We're trying to create good workers, right? To go into society and go and work, you know, punch in their time clock from nine to five and work for someone else. And the, the top 1%, their kids are in very different schools. Well, why is that? Because they actually know what's really going on in the back end, right? So I actually started a, a, a program um, and I'm running this pilot program right now at a fifth and sixth grade. It'll be launched for the 24, 25 school year. Um, but what I am trying to do is do it in, in three phases where we do, um, you know, starting off with the, the teachers and then next would be phase two would be the parents and then educating the children um, and trying to do that so we can start to create an environment that is um, 
really safe for these kids to learn and for everyone to feel seen and heard and be able to be authentically who they are. That's a very long two to three things, but there you go. Joel, I don't know about you, but I just wanted to do like a mic drop and say, okay, guys, that's the show. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs> Everything's been said. Um, but, um, uh, you know, Shana, uh, yeah. it, Joel, I'm going to hand it to you before I, I, I carry on because I've got tons buzzing in my head right now. I think I know exactly what you're going to say there as well, Mac. Um, but, yeah, so with the eight with the eight hour work with the eight hours, um yeah, I've got so many questions surrounding that just that alone. Uh first of all I have no filter, so I don't really give a crap who um how they, how uh, <laughs> um how I say this, but who in their I don't think right mind I I hate not which person in their right mind would want to make kids uh, do that long? Most adults can't even do that long, let alone. Ab absolutely. I mean, if you think about, I mean, just that point there, Joel, I mean, the fact that most adults, you know, uh, you know there's so many books out there like the four day week or the four hour work week or the, you know, you know, all these adults have kind of grown up and gone, oh, hold on, this structure doesn't work for me. We need to be able to have this, you know, work-life balance. And then we force our children to go to school for eight to nine hours a day. Um, but a lot of that, you know, if you think about it from a logical perspective, a lot of that's been kind of driven around trying to keep economies go going um, and uh, effectively keep, as you were saying, you know, the, um, uh, Shana was saying about the 1%, it's trying to keep that 99% in the workforce so that, you know, um, it's almost like a nine hour daycare center. And it's like, how do we keep children busy for eight to nine hours? We'll throw lots of stuff at them. Um, and the reality is that doesn't, it, it just doesn't, um, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, but even if you think about languages as an example, you know, I grew up in a, a bilingual home and as a child, it was easy to you know, switch between the two. Um, and as a child, you have a lot less resistance because you have less experience um, and less um, baggage, as it were, that you've brought along the way. So that's why it's much harder to learn when you're older, because you are making decisions based on past experiences. Whereas children, this is all new, you know, um, and that's why they learn so quickly. And you see children that can pick up three, four, five languages very early on in life. Um, but adults will say to themselves, oh, well, I can't, you know, I was terrible at school. So, you know, with languages, so I can't pick up anything else. So the the decision gets made based on a, a an experience. Um, and I don't know, Shana, have you come across Dr. John Demartini? Um, definitely um, somebody to go and, and have a look at because he talks about a lot of the things that you talk about, about the trauma that gets left in the body mm -hmm. as a result of experiences in your world. And, you know, this is why you'll have people who end up going through the same vicious cycles in life uh, because they don't deal with that trauma that, a lot of the time that trauma, uh, you know, based on, on some of his research, goes right back to um, uh, the womb. You know, it's, it's, it's the trauma that the, the, the baby goes through while developing um, before birth and, and then even after that. So a lot of the things that we don't understand is because we, don't, we haven't dealt with those traumas and those um, things that have been left as almost like muscle memory or, um, in our body. And, you know, we, we need to learn from that childlike behavior. Um, and like you say, you know, being able to have that playtime, having that social learning, uh, these are things that are vital for children to learn. Yet we put them in a classroom and after six lessons, you know, give them a hard time because they're not. And I, and I see this in my daughter's school, as an example, always fighting with the system because the system doesn't allow for a child that's different 
Um, it's like, well, I've got 30 kids to deal with. And I feel for those teachers because it is hard when you've got 30 kids and you've been given the responsibility to educate all 30 of them. But if they're one or two that are seen as the you know disruptors of the class, you know, our education system should be recognizing that. So what what suggestions do you have around your know, earlier recognition of these things? Because you know, I don't know about yourself, but I I only found out about ADHD and my um, uh, dyslexia when I was almost thirty, um, and in my forties about my ADHD. So I'm, I'm <laughs> like, you know, if I'd known earlier. I would have changed my whole way of learning. So what are your thoughts on that you know, earlier diagnosis? Um, and then what should support look like? I'll be honest with you. I mean, I think that as far as education and, and educators are concerned, um, that's why I'm making such a big push on uh, you know parents and educators. Because if we recognize that every single child experiences different types of stress, that create things like ADHD and dyslexia. That is created, to your point, from the womb, from the time you you are conceived. And every individual on this planet has different stresses at different points in their development, which will lead to certain things. And, and the way your, your cells work, your biology, the way the brain functions, the way things start to wire and connect, it is completely around environment. So if we can uh, kind of stop living in our shells or with our heads in the sand, and I think just having conversations like this, being able to have people that are no neurodivergent or, you know, people that are the, the disruptors, the bad kids, you know, if we can start to, and this is, this is really what I'm focusing on now. If we can start uh, having the conversations with the people that are responsible for these children when they are away from their parents, starting at the daycare level is, is eventually where I would like to go. And giving these children environments where they feel safe, they feel heard, they're getting all of their needs met. The four basic human needs need to be met. And the thing with things like violence or being disruptive, that meets all of your basic human needs. It's in a disempowering way, but how can we teach educators or daycare providers and parents on how to raise children that are able to have an environment where they are able to meet those needs in an empowering way, right? So that's that's basically what I teach. Um, and that is the only way that we can start making a change. Because if we wait until these children are older, if we are waiting until they're already meeting their needs in a disempowering way, we've already missed it. So I really, and this is why I switched to education, to be honest with you, because it was amazing to see a change in a family, but I'm only able to impact those one to three children in that home, right? So the amount of time it was taking me to impact just one or two or three kids in that one home, well, if I can do that on a larger scale through an education system and try to create a program, which by the way, is getting a lot of resistance because they don't want free thinkers. Um, the one school that said yes um, was because the principal himself is, uh, he has a lot of trauma responses. And I think the fact that I was able to recognize that and tell him exactly who he is as a person, he was like, okay, I think I need you to help my, my problem kids. Right. Um, but that being said, <laughs> if we can help these kids prior to them meeting these needs in a disempowering way and becoming violent or becoming aggressive or, uh, you know, depressed or anxious or suicidal, all of these things that you see in the preteen and teen years, that's where I think our target needs to be just mass education. Um, the unfortunate part about that as a solution is it receives uh, a lot of pushback because as you know, it is keeping the mass majority of people under your thumb and there are the select few that need to stay you know, in control or in power and managing pretty much all of the resources that we have. Um, you know, and this is especially in the United States, I'm not sure about where you're from, but I'm speaking mainly with the U.S. I, th I think that's uh, you know a historic and a global uh, challenge. Um, you know, throughout time, um, you know anybody who doesn't kind of toe the line is a challenge. Um, and I think it's it's all about changing the narrative around why this is so important. 
Um, you know, we've yeah. already seen over the last 20 years how many individuals that are neurodiverse have bucked the trend. They've 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 gone out and and done incredible things that had it not been for those achievements, wouldn't let people realize that ah oh, things can be done differently. Um, and that's the the I think um, you know a lot of people talk about being disabled because you have some um, whether it be neurological or physical you know uh, difference. Um, but the reality is, like you were saying, is about enabling environments. Um, and I think that th the challenge is greater than trying to just change one or two minds. It's about educating globally about enabling environments. Changing the masses, yeah. Um, I mean, Joel, what kind of questions or, or comments have uh, kind of come to mind for you based on what Sh Shane has just been talking about? Because I know we've covered some of this in the past and it, you know, it gets quite contentious because some people feel like their noses are being put out of joint. If by people you mean the government, then you're spot on, Mac. Um, uh, you know, that's just a small part of it. I mean, ultimately, you know, we're seeing now in government recently where they're starting to talk about neurodiversity and changing that. But well, there is a it should have been done 20 years ago, 100 talking, years ago. There's a fundamental difference between talking and doing. There, there's a massive difference. Yeah, I think, you know, where the challenge comes in between thinking and doing, um, you know, many of us people want to just talk till the cows come home and they don't want to do. I mean, that's just, um, you mean political speak? Well, <laughs> when it comes to the educational system <laughs> or any sort of system of changing, changing the uh, education, it does tend to come down to the people who like to think they know how to run the country. Um, well, I'm not bashing any politicians specifically because otherwise I yes, would be here all day um, long. Um, but, um, you know, and, and let's, I mean, uh, the, the elephant in the room, you know, politicians or politics, you know, we all know somebody that's got into power because they want to make a difference because that's the initial, you know, they get into politics because they believe they can drive change. Um, and unfortunately, we see over time when they bash their heads against the wall so often that they start realizing the red tape and the institution that has been around for so long doesn't allow for that quick change and things to happen. And I mean, I look at the UK and the current state it's in at the moment with various things like <laughs> the post office scandal that you know took uh, twenty odd years to resolve the you know um, bad blood scandal that's just come out that's also taken like 30, 40 years, um, and you know, for me, it equates to running a business. If you look at a lot of startups, they fail forward. They break a lot of things in order to kind of succeed and make things happen. And you see magic happen. But the moment those organizations reach a certain point, they plateau out because the company's grown so much that this is where all the policies and guidelines and everything else gets put in and everybody's worried about being sued. And, you know, all of a sudden it's, it, instead of being driven by inspiration and vision, it starts getting driven by fear and um, loss. And how do we keep this organization and keep everybody in line? And then all of a sudden you get those institutionalized thinking come through and you'll see organizations that did amazing things 20 years ago today take a year to do what they did in a day, you know, 20 years ago because of all this red tape. Um, so, you know, I'm going to throw this one at China. I mean, when it comes to, and, and I don't want to just talk, you know, one country or one school, or one in, you know, one family, because this is, this is a global thing. This is really something that needs to be tackled yes, it is. from the top down, because getting from the bottom up is going to take us forever. Um, you know, two questions. One, what would you like to see? when it comes to people grabbing change, uh, change as, it, as it were, and driving that forward. Um, and on the other side, in fact, I'm going to go with that one first before I go into the other one. Let's do one at a time. Thank you, because my, my ADHD brain is like, wait, one thing at a time. 
<laughs> I just realized that because I, my brain's thinking of so many different things and I can try to do too many and then I've got to pull back and go, slow down, one thing yeah, at a time, yeah. because that's how you get things done. Yes. And uh, that th that is um, that is definitely something I struggle with, right? And I'll have a question or I'll have a task and then I'll forget it two seconds later if I don't write it down. Joel knows this because I think our entire conversation I was writing. Um, so I have a different spin on it. I truly believe that it cannot come from the top down and I will tell you why. I think they are so deep rooted already in the disempowering way of how they handle things. The mindset that you ch and, and the the um, the older these people are, right? So when you have the politicians that have been in for decades at this point, to get that mindset to change is to me near impossible. What I would love to see is more people sitting in their authentic empowerment, having an abundance mindset, being, and actually I think I read on the comments, Divine had said this, uh, as far as being able to, to regulate, to self-regulate and not have these, uh, age regressive type reactions, right? To be able to respond to things as opposed to react to them. I truly think that it has to come from the bottom. I think the more people from the bottom that we can get to come together as a, as a collective and say, no, we're demanding change. And you know, if there's yeah. companies, for example, that are not being ethical or they are putting things in that are toxic, for example, and endocrine disruptors, and this in itself, I could talk about it, uh, well that's done. another show that's a whole other show that we'll have to go through there we will but have to do that yes we will have to do that but you know we're basically hot or, or from the top down it is make us physically sick mentally and emotionally sick it is all about suppression right we, we are uh, oppressing our people um we're we're creating these environments where we have to people have to suppress who they are suppress what they're feeling um, suppress what's going on in order to get anywhere. We also see this politically, right, where you might have those uh, people that go into office that are truly, they're gung-ho, they're, they're out there, they're ready to go, they're trying to make change, they know it's going to take a seat in, in some office somewhere, whether that be locally, you know, state or, or what have you. However, they realize very quickly that the the politicians surrounding them will uh, what's the nicest way to say this? They, they will crush them, essentially, and destroy any chance they have of being su successful at anything if they do not comply with the majority of the top one or two percent, right? Um, so I truly believe that the change has to come from the bottom. The more people we can educate that are the bottom feeders, if you will, right? The people that are considered the unimportant, the uneducated, right? That is where the power lies, because at the end of the day, there are way more. You want to talk about power and numbers. There are a, can I cuss on this show? Because I've been trying to hold it. I'm holding my cuss Yes, word. we're all adults on this show. Oh, Lord. I'm trying to, like, think about what I'm saying, because I'm like, a cuss word is going to slip out. And that's that's probably I, not going to be good. As, as long as we don't have multiple coming out, because I think, you know, ultimately, this is on LinkedIn. So yes. LinkedIn do have that, you know, reporting for the but this is just us being real. So, um, yes. you know, uh, as long as we're not doing it to abuse. If I, if I accidentally slip, though, I'm not going to get in trouble. Right? So, Absolutely. Uh, yes. So this is this is where, you know, I believe that um, getting together in power of numbers, that's where it's going to, to truly change. We are the ones that buy everything. Right. We're the ones that play into the system. We're the ones that we do work. And as far as these four day work weeks and the work life balance and the burnouts and all these things that you hear about, it would not exist if people learned how to be authentically empowered, how to be in alignment with what is true and right for them. Work wouldn't feel like a nine to five. You could do it every hour of every week and you would be totally happy and content because you're living in alignment with your purpose. This is what I'm trying to change, especially with kids. And I feel like I'm targeting, uh, this sounds really bad. I'm not targeting kids in like, any, I'm like sitting here like, no, not in that way. I am targeting education with children specifically because I, I truly believe the younger this can be implemented, the younger these kids can be taught these skill sets, the younger we can get through to these families that are having these children, the better it's going to be when these children grow up and in another 10, 20 years from now, 
the world could be very different for my grandkids. I already have two grandkids, surprisingly enough, right? We have five kids that range. So we're, we're slightly psychotic here um, in Texas. So uh, my husband and I have five kids that range between the ages of, uh, you know, almost two and a half. She's, uh, she turned two at the end of January and our oldest is 25. Our 23 year old has two kids, right? She has a two and a half year old, almost three. And uh, she just had a baby four months ago. So um, I am now looking at how can I impact at least the society that I am able to get through to, right? How many people can I impact to change at least a part of the world for my kids, for my grandchildren, right? So that if I can, if I can impact five people directly, if I can stop five kids from doing things in a, in a negative way or a disempowering way, those five kids can now impact another five or 10. Those five or 10 can now potentially impact another 20. So my, my goal really is to get this to a few, even if I can do that, and hope that they can then make it a new norm instead of bullying, instead of targeting, especially neurodivergent children, because I feel like every neurodivergent person I've talked to was bullied in some way growing up. We were mm -hmm. targeted by our parents. We were targeted by our teachers. We felt like pieces of crap, right? All of these things then created us to hit a threshold at some point, we've all done it, where we just said enough is enough, right? That is yeah. usually when our creativity sparked. That's when our innovation came, came through, right? That's when we were like, you know, screw this. We're going to just do it my way, right? Because living in this world that is typical never worked for me before. So now I'm just going to completely throw everything on its head and I'm going to now hit my, my rebel stage, right? So now I'm going to go out there and I'm just going to rock star it, you know? Um, as far as the label is concerned, this is how we become society's rock stars. We eventually hit some threshold. And that's kind of when we pushed into who we are at, as an individual and what it is that we, and here's the cool thing about neurodivergence I have found. Generally speaking, they have done something in their life that has been of such significant impact to others, whether that be through, you know, music, whether that be through art and poetry, or whether that just be through starting companies or, or doing something in their life that's going to create impact. And I truly believe that that came from a place of not being seen or heard growing up. That That's at least how I feel. And my entire mission in life now is to throw up the, uh, throw up the finger at everyone that, that doubted me, you know, told me I wouldn't amount to anything because I was different or I learned different or I talked different or I behaved differently. Right. Oh, I'm absolutely loving this because, you know, when I threw that spanner in the works about the top down, um, I was thinking about, uh, an incredible man that I met, uh, through Microsoft who is involved in emergency services. And I was at a conference where he was speaking and somebody in the audience went, you know, there's all this new technology and there's all this amazing stuff that's happening. But unfortunately, some organizations are just so set in their ways. And what do you see as the biggest obstacle to change? And he went, people. And I was like, okay, yeah, fair enough. That sounds, you know, about right. Yeah, and, and, she, and, and this lady responded and said, but what happens if the people at the top are not open to change. And he went, well, it's time for them to retire and get the hell out of the way. And I was <laughs> like, ooh, okay. I was like, that's pretty, that's quite a bold statement. But the reality is, you know, and it's actually quite simplistic because this happens in, whether it be in family life or business life or in organizations, um, you know, uh, that are nonprofit, it's people that are trying to a lot of the time look after their own comfort zone mm -hmm. that are the, the they they the blockage to change um and that's because you know as an example you know in technology a lot of the time the people whose jobs will be affected by that technology change are the ones who will be most against that change um because they fear the change and what will happen to them and their career um, and that's the same thing. And it comes down to vulnerability, you know, whether you're confident enough in yourself to say, where would this take us? Where, you know, what are the opportunities that this opens up? Um, 
And I love the way you put that, you know, the growth in numbers or the power in numbers, because that is reality. But it takes more conversations like this for people to realize that they're not on their own and other people are fighting for the same outcome, for the you know, same improvements. Um, so, you know, we're only just scratching the surface here, learning about who you are and what you do. And, we are, and yeah. Joel, don't you just love the passion? I do, and I also when you mentioned when you mentioned about the a lot about the politicians lightly and stuff like that, I like we would we would I think we would need uh, uh, an entire four hours devoted just to Fishy Rishi, as we call him over here in the UK. Um, I love that because. Of what he wants to do with benefits for people with disability, which is if you haven't even seen if you haven't seen the news over here, which is changing the cash payouts to allow people to you know live to replace them with vouchers, which would be as about as unhelpful as my dog trying to do my homework. Um, And he's a clever dog. Um, but here, here's the thing. So you're know, bringing dogs into the picture. Um, you know, I was, I had this long conversation with my, my, what, what was a teenager. She's turning 20 this year. And, you know, and as a parent, um, Shana, you'll know that you, you know, it's not always smooth sailing and there's, there's challenges that you have to learn to communicate and, you know, overcome uh, different barriers in life and, um, you know, as a parent, you're always overprotective because you've gone through the experiences they haven't even thought of. Um, and, you know, my daughter and I, a, a few years ago, were having this argument about, you know, but my friend's parents let them do this and my friend's parents do let them do that. And I went, oh, OK. And I went, I said, that's actually quite an interesting statement because I used I remember saying the exact same to my parents. <laughs> and then I thought about it and I was like, well, hold on. I said, actually, um, and then I, you know, we started delving into a few questions, and I said to her, "Okay, so if you pick five of your friends, um, you know, all of them have exactly the same bedtime." And she went, "No," and I went, "Why is that?" And she went, "Well, different circumstances, different situation." And I was like, oh, "Okay." And then I asked her, you know, several other questions, and not one of them had the same, you know, was the same rule for everybody. And then I, you know, I explained that. You know, as a parent, the scary thing is when you leave the hospital with your newborn baby, nobody gives you that book and says, hey, by the way, this this is the rule book. You know, this is what you need to know. You need to you know, understand how to educate your child, how to support them, you know, to give them love. Like all those basics, we just have to kind of fail forward and figure that out as we go. Yet when it comes to pets... My, have you ever tried to adopt a pet? It's yes. insane. You, you, they have to come and do an inspection before the pet's allowed to come home. They want to know all your history. They want to know are there kids and that. That, like, there's a whole almost like a risk assessment done around adopting a pet. Yet it's okay to just walk out of a hospital with a baby and hey, good luck. Well, who knows where that's going to go? Um, <laughs> and if you look at, you know and I look at my dog as an example, you know, dog trainers understand they need to work with each dog individually because they are all different and they have different environments yep. that they've you know, been in. So they get it. Why can't our, so like our education system realize that, Hey, maybe humans also need like to upgrade our education. Um, so it's just, yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll throw that out and I just you know, kind of wanted your, th your thoughts on that. So as far as that's concerned, I think that's because uh, we understand that animals, right? We, we think that they're different than we are. I actually don't find them to be different at all. If you have a dog, for example, right? Um, I've actually rescued quite a few pit bulls, which are, um, you know, known as being the, the worst dogs you can have. I've never had a bad one. Um, that being said, they feed completely off of energy, right? I tell people all the time, it's all based on energy, right? Like no, even 
you know, money, money, for example, it's not good or bad. It's what energy are you putting behind it? You're either putting a positive spin or a negative spin. You either feel like it's going to be uh, an abundance mindset or you have a scarcity mindset, right? And I think as far as when you're relating that back to human beings, we are raised and have so much inherited generational traumas that have come from actual big T traumas in you know, many generations ago, but have been passed down generation over generation over generation that leaves us with these mindsets or belief systems that are actually quite disempowering. So a lot of people actually live like they're sleeping until they have some experience where they are generally uh, having, having their awakening, if you will, right? Where they kind of realize the bigger picture. We're all kind of taught, and, and I'm super generalizing here, but we're taught that, you know, you go out and then, you know, you go to school and then you go to college and you get married and you have children and you work this job until your retirement age. And then you retire and live enough for you and your kids. And, and that's the extent of, of your lifetime here on this planet. I truly, and whatever people's beliefs are, there is some type of higher power that most people, if not all, believe in. There, there's some something somebody believes in on, on a universal or a uh, God type of state, right? So that higher power or the fragments of the this massive energy where we all came from, that is what our purpose is. When we look at the bigger, I mean, the huge picture of who am I energetically on this earth and what am I, what was I created, not by my parents, by my higher power to be and to impact on this earth. And you have that massive awakening. I mean, it's, it's like, it's like getting the, the 64 pack of crayons when you've had the, the little eight pack, the little, you know, eight or 10 pack little crayon things for your whole life. And all of a sudden, so, sudden someone for Christmas gets you this massive, it's like all these colors, all this stuff is so much cool, you know, crap you can do with it. And you just get all excited. That was what it was like when I had my awakening and other people that I've spoken to start looking at life differently. Because once they realize that, oh, wow, that little voice inside of me that kept kind of nudging me, that time that I kept feeling like I wanted to trust myself, but did what I thought society or my parents or whoever wanted me to do, my boss, right? My husband, my wife, I mean, the list goes on. As far as that is concerned, we're doing all of these things for other people and we're not actually in alignment and in tune with that higher energy that is talking directly to us. That feeling of, you know, something's right or something's wrong and then we ignore it. That's what I want to teach kids. That inner voice, right? That's what you listen to no matter what. So wow. <laughs> that, I mean, that's... Joel, what did you want to say before I, I dive in? Because mind-blowing. It's just... You're so in alignment with where you want to move to yep. mm -hmm. that the clarity is just on point, which, yeah, you know, I get a lot of people come to me and, and, and tell me what they want to achieve, but there's no clarity. And it's because they're not, you know, they, a lot of the time they're looking at what, what other people are doing and thinking, you know, should I do that or should I do this? So they don't focus on their why. Um, and once you find that why, it's a different world. I mean, Joel, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are in about 1,600 songs on our, on our Spotify playlist, man. <laughs> and that's a serious playlist. Um, so, you know, the, the topic is how neurodivergent individuals became society's yeah. rock stars. So I want to ask a question around that is – Let's start with this. You're based on your experience so far because you you clearly are passionate about yeah. what you're doing. Mm -hmm. you know, what proof have you seen that this change or the different way of doing things will create more rock stars in society that are neurodivergent, as an example? I mean, I was <laughs> here's more information that I don't share very often. Uh, in my lifetime, um, as a young adult, as a single mom at the time, um, I raised quite a few foster kids. Um, quite a few of them, I, I specifically took in uh, emergency placements in, in the foster care system when I lived in Massachusetts. I specifically took in preteens and teens that were about to 
age out were considered the problem kids, right? The neurodivergent children, essentially. They were the disruptors, the ones no one wanted, bouncing from house to house. I took them in. At one point, I had eight kids, including my own biological, that I was raising by myself. There is not a single one of them. I actually still talk to every single one today um, now that they're, you know, in college uh, and some of them finishing up high school. They're older now, especially the, the younger ones that I had. Um, but that being said, there isn't a single one that once they felt safe, once they felt that ease, there wasn't any tension, there wasn't survival mode, they could just be and they could just do, and they could just laugh, and they could be silly, or they could be angry. And, and I know this sounds crazy, but I just allowed them to sit in whatever it was that they needed to sit in, in that moment. And I was just there. I was just there. And I was like the, the buddy on the, the buddy that you want as an adult when you're really going through a hard time and you're having your ugly cry. And you know, you have the buddy on the bench with you or on your couch, just put your, my arm was just over these girls, just like, hey, Cry it out. Or if you need to scream or you, you need to go through these things, just process it however it is that you need to. And once we go through that, that massive big emotion, we're going to sit and we're going to just try to figure out what we can do to start to regulate. But I was able, I had to co-regulate initially. These kids were never taught how to self-regulate, right? So they had these explosive disruptive outbursts, but there wasn't a single one that did not completely change the course of their life by just being allowed to experience the very dark and the, the, the super bright light. There wasn't one that didn't respond well to safety and connection and love, right? And that's what I try to teach families. That connection, that safety is what every single individual needs, especially those neurodivergent kids. We absolutely need to give it to them because we already... These kids are already targeted to be the black sheep, if you will, right? Neurodivergence, they are generally the black sheep of the family, the ones that no one gets along with, the, the weird kids, you know, we're always the, the ones that no one wants to hang out with, the ones that only, we have a very small circle. It's literally like a pencil point. Your circle is so small, you know? We didn't have a ton of friends and no one wanted to hang out with us. And we, were, we didn't even feel like we belonged in our own families, at, at least from, from the experiences I've had. And when you, when you realize that that is the case and you can open up these doors for these parents or these educators to look at these kids not as problem kids, but they're having a hard time. They're not giving you a hard time. So how can we connect and love them through that and help them co-regulate so that they can eventually self-regulate and not be so aggressive or disruptive or explosive? That That's really, that's, that's my personal belief. Oh, I, I, I love that because... It it, it kind of ties into the analogy of the the, the uh, process of learning. You know, as an example, if you are learning to drive a vehicle, you, know, you go through that, um, the four quadrants, as it were, of learning, where you, know, you kind of find out that you don't know what you don't know. Um, and uh, you know, that moment you climb in behind the wheel and you've been watching your parents drive for years and you think, ah, this is easy. And then you get in and you sit behind the wheel and then the damn thing won't move and it jerks all over the place and you think, ah, okay. So you consciously now know you don't know um, and you've got to go through that cycle and then you've got to be taught, okay, what is it that I don't know so that I can get to a stage where consciously I now know, but I've got to think about the process in order to be able to you know, do things differently. And then I get to the stage where I'm you know, um, uh, consciously competent and I'm now able to do this, uh, but I'm still thinking about, the, yeah. you know, the process. And then you get to the unconscious competent stage where, you know, and this is where I love watching women drive because they'll be driving, you know, doing the lashes, combing their hair, screaming at a kid over here. And, and it's like the multitasking that's going on is insane. And I couldn't even... You know, if somebody turned the radio on, I wouldn't be able to drive because it's like, no, there's a distraction. Um, but it's going through those stages and what you've just spoken about there. I mean, wow. Um, you know, with the right support, I mean, the message for me is yeah. so clear that if you allow somebody and, and that's called therapy, you know, but people don't understand what therapy is because a lot of us think 
oh therapy and you know even myself and i'm married to a psychotherapist <laughs> um you know initially i was always like going to be psychoanalyzed and blah 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 all the but actually it's just that ability to actually find that opportunity to feel that you can be yourself and then know that that support is there for you to get to where you want to go to and what you know, what you were talking about there shana your experience and what you've been through i mean you you've literally been helping rock stars you know be created out in the world but it's that starfish story you know one at a time and now or eight at a time <laughs> well, eight at a time i mean that that is just <laughs> mind-blowing i know uh one of the ladies and you you uh, come across her in one uh, social Saturday room, um, Lachelle, um, as an example, who's America's super mom with 15 kids. And I'm like, mm, I don't know how I'd cope. Um, but it is time now that through combined ripple effects with people like yourself and many others around the world, yeah, you know, if we throw enough pebbles into the ocean, we'll cause a tsunami. But that's what we need is we need that cumulative um, power of everybody seeing that it's time for change um so you know i'm, I'm gee whiz the hours flown by um joel <laughs> yeah i have uh, yeah i have flown by yeah we, we do this every time and it's like yeah, yeah we're gonna aim for like 40 45 minutes it never happens um no, but, that's why i scrapped that idea and just gone for an hour because yeah <laughs> but if you could leave those watching with one thought you know, about how we can create more rock star. I mean, you've already been through that personal experience. Yeah. Um, but knowing that there are copious amounts of other people like yourself out there that have, through experience, know that there's a difference that can be made. What's the, I guess, message you want to send out to those individuals so that we can have that combined uh, ripple effect? Man, there's, uh, I mean, there's, there's really two major things that I would love to say, but it is um, none of us know anything, right? And, and if you've ever been to uh, some of the audio rooms that, that we go on, um, I think that I have learned so much because I always assume I don't know, right? I'm never trying to prove myself right. So I think when we can take that ego out of it and we can truly connect with each other because we do each still have there, there's 8.1 dil, uh, billion different perspectives right different lived experiences so at the end of the day even if you and i are sitting here and, and we're able to relate and we're able to connect and we have even the same passion you still have a totally different lived experience than i do so always assuming that you have something to learn by every single individual that you encounter I think is a, is a major thing I would love to say to people. And you have such a power within you. And I think that it, and this was true for me and maybe it isn't for everyone else, but when you are targeted and you're neurodivergent or not, you know, if you're neurotypical, that's okay too. It still applies. When you have been beaten down so much in your life, you become fear. I was fearful of people for the longest time. I was so anxious that I was going to be judged, right? Or laughed at. So I think when you can completely sit in your authentic power that you have from that universal massive energy that we, we all are just fragments of, and you tap into that and self-reflect and can sit in that empowerment and tie together with other people that are aligned with you, and have at least the same general outlook, then we can start to band together. Then we can start taking everyone's lived experience, everyone's knowledge, and now as a collective whole, my gosh, there's no stopping us at that point. So just authentically empowered, that's literally just, if you sit in that for a little bit. I'm gonna have to sit on that one for a while because there's so much that you've just packed into a, little pack of dynamite right there and it's you know it kind of transcends just neurodiversity it, it transcends into 
you know, religious differences, cultural differences, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Every, um, everything, really. Whew, I'm going to sit back for a second because I've got a lot to di digest here. And Shana, we, we're going to have to have many more conversations um, and yes, uh, definitely, you know, off, definitely. offline conversations as well to see how we can support you and you know, get the, your message out there as well. Um, and um, so, Joel, I'm going to pass the mic to you um, for any kind of final words um, and make sure that Shana shares how we can share with others to get hold of her and support her and all the things that she's working on. Well, first of all, Mark, she, I would like to, well, first of all, thank you for getting over the hour. <laughs> um and and i'm sure mac you'll agree with me that you shana uh have pretty much almost made that what we <laughs> made what we're about <laughs> redundant in a, in a sense um because more people like you. This is this is what with more people like what you do, and then what we do, and hopefully there'll be it'll be lovely. There'll be no need for. I say everyone will sort of get the message. Eventually. Thank you, Joel. So thank you, everyone who has stayed around all all the time. I can't see who that is because I've only got one screen. <laughs> um. And we'll be back again, I'm sure, very soon with another. Yes, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to thank both of you uh, for having me on, Joel. I think our initial 30-minute meeting that went like, I don't even know how long. I can't remember how long I talked to you. It was so long. Um, but that that was an incredible conversation. And I just thank you, uh, Joel, very much for um, just being a good virtual friend, right? Never met you in person, but I felt so connected to you. and Mac. Man, you are just a powerhouse. I've listened to you so many times. It's awesome to be able to finally see your face um, and not just your little, you know, your little circle. <laughs> but I thank you both so much. I think you guys are both powerhouses. Um, I love this conversation. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I did see some of the comments, so I just wanted to thank you to everyone that was listening and everyone that did, um, you know, take the time to comment and hang out with us a little bit on Memorial Day if you're in the U.S., um, and I, I just can't thank you guys enough. And I just want to let you know how much I love you and how much I appreciate you. Awesome stuff. Well, uh, you know, the comments have been coming through thick and fast and I've been flashing them up on the screen, trying to keep up. I, can't and <laughs> I, 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 I tell you what, um, if, if we had to go through everybody's comments, I think we would have been here for at least another three or four hours um, <laughs> just to kind of elaborate. Um, but we're conscious of, of people's times. And, yes. And yours. Um, you know, well, everybody, but you know, for all of those people that have commented, we've got uh, you know, Chris has commented, Divine has commented, Sophie, thank you so much, uh, um, Jason, Jason, thank you so much, um, and we've had several others as well that have commented. You guys have been amazing, um, but uh, yeah, we've just uh, flashed a, a small Michelle, thank you so much, Philip. Um, uh, yeah, the list goes on. Um, but thank you all for, for your comments. Please, if this conversation has been useful to you, do yourself share a favor it. and go and share it. Um, you know, Go and tag. If it's on LinkedIn, just tag in the comments uh, somebody that you think that this may either be able to help uh, just open you know, uh, conversations going or you know, somebody that you think, hold on, you know, they need to be in contact with Shana. Um, you know, use that uh, whether it be on youtube or facebook uh, but please do reach out um, and any questions that you may have that could have arisen from today put those in the comments as well we will come back and you know uh, we get notified with all the comments so we'll make sure that we respond to those as and when we can as well so um really appreciate it and uh, so great shana just to uh, you know, have a physical well a virtual <laughs> a video conversation where we can actually see facial expressions as well yes um, yes, absolutely. And one seeing day me trying to go back and forth. <laughs> I'm not techie. I'm leaving the tech to y'all. But uh, yeah, this is this has been so much fun. I thank you guys so much again. And uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you, thank you everyone.
Cheers, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a great day. Bye.